been able to get an encouraging word and a challenge from uh, Pastor Lawrence as a way to kind of help us start our conversation and frame it. You know, Lawrence, what I really, uh, listening to you talk about this, it reminded me of one of the learnings that I've taken away over the last year, which is it's easier for me to just say, we've sort of finished and settled a whole lot of these conversations. They're all sort of behind us. And uh, can't we just sort of look forward? Uh, and there's a part of this that if we don't go back and really take a, a harder look at what has happened and how that informs today, uh, it's gonna keep coming back for us. And, uh, and hearing so many stories um, over the last, uh, the last year uh, has been, uh, it's reminded me, and it has uh, helped me to kind of double down um, in my own heart, exploring these things, and also to commit us as a community of faith, of Christ followers, uh, to take his story and make it uh, the, uh, the dominant idea, that dominant theme that will help shape the rest of these kinds of conversations, mm. and so I really appreciate that. Yeah, that's right. So this is, uh, of course, uh, a key part of the conversation about biblical justice. Uh, this is one of those things that uh, when we talk about racism and we talk about race, um, for many years, uh, the churches have, uh, and lots of Christians, have decided that these issues really are sort of over. They're sort of settled. We don't really need to be talking about them anymore. And uh, if we can take away something over the last year, it's a deep appreciation that that is not true, uh, that this is very much a needed and a real conversation, and that uh, we have some holes in our understanding of biblical justice that uh, it is worth us exploring. And so I think we know that race is an important topic. It's a part of the application of the gospel, of his story. It's also, of course, uh, woven throughout the scriptures along with dozens of other themes of biblical justice. And so it's one of many important conversations that the church has to continue to have if we are going to represent uh, Jesus in the world. And uh, it's helpful for me to remember this and to be reminded of it. Uh, we, um, it was just this last year, Cheryl uh, was sharing a story with me uh, that uh, it, it just made us very sad. She was uh, out for a, a walk, a jog with a friend of hers. And uh, she was, they were going down the sidewalk and kind of getting moving. And uh, they had, her friend noticed that her shoe was untied. And so the two of them stopped abruptly and bent down to tie her shoe. But at the time, my wife was still looking down the sidewalk and she noticed there was a black man running toward them out for a jog. And when he saw them stop suddenly, two white girls on a walk, he stopped suddenly with a panicked look and looked around and then crossed the street, which seemed like an attempt to not make them more nervous than they seemed to be when they stopped. And of course, it's, you know, there's so many layers to it and you look at it and you go, this is you know, this is, uh, you know, th th this was all a, a thing that, that shouldn't have happened in our culture. And, of course, my wife came home sad because she recognized that this is, in fact, his normal experience. For that to be his reaction, it's his normal experience. And I know you guys have had uh, experiences as well. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's interesting. Um, go going through life, and uh, experiencing some situations like that, um, kind of from the other side of it, uh, you know, so I, I know what it is to be even jogging down the street and see people go over, over to the other side, or, uh, you know, be walking even with my cute, adorable little dog down the sidewalk and have someone parked in a car and then see them kind of reach over and lock their door. Now, here's what I would say. Um, experiences like that are hurtful. Um, I think I'm also growing in an appreciation of the fact that many times th those, are not, those are not malicious acts per se. Um, they come as a result of the assumptions that we make about each other. And so are, are there those that maybe make assumptions about me based on the color of my skin, maybe have some sense that I, I might be dangerous to them? Perhaps. Um, but I think we all make assumptions about one another based on things like that. 
Um, so uh, I'm seeing that, uh, that wh while it is hurtful and is, is important for us to have these conversations and be aware of this, it doesn't necessarily, I hope it doesn't result in um, defensiveness because I don't believe that it is necessarily malicious. Um, but it is worthy of bringing these things to light so we can talk about them. Yeah, I, I, I similarly think, especially, it's, it's, um, it's not something people are conscious of mm -hmm. in most cases, right? Um, in many cases, let me just say many, let me say not most. Um, and, and I think in my context, sometimes it's, it's kind of the, uh, the, the spoils of grace where some person is maybe intending a comment to be positive, right? That by the grace of God, I've been able to be well-educated and, and, and be at... And, and be some amazing places. And having conversations where someone will slowly will say or just say like, you know, like, but, but you're different, you know, uh, because I went to Harvard, because I went to Stanford, because I went to Gordon Conwell, because of this. It's, it's almost like you could, you know, like, I, I'm not talking about you, but <laughs> you're, you're different. Um, and that's aside from the fact of beyond the individual um, experiences I've had, I, you know, I've, I, I, I encountered it really, really young. Um, and so I say to say that even with good intention, even separating, you even see under the, under the, under the, the surface that there is these deep-seated views of these exceptional people, and that in view of these exceptional people, I, I call it the Obama effect, that everything else is different because this person could exceed, that all of that is riffraff. Look at you. Wow. That's also been a part of my own uh, exploration and learnings. Um, over the last year, uh, hearing more and more uh, stories uh, very, very similar to that, and even trying to see how those things still, still linger in my own heart, my own way of thinking about these things, because, of course, I come from my own background and my own context, just like everyone, and, and, um, and because of that, you know, we, we do wrestle, we do continue to have to have these conversations, I think. You know, it's funny, in a, in a, in a weird way, that uh, this has been such a uh, challenging conversation because when you look at the scriptures, we get to see so clearly that sin, you know, you were in Gen we're in Genesis 3, sin is our, our dominant experience and you read Genesis and you see how quickly it fractured relationships and how it divided people and then suddenly we come to this conversation and even Christ followers are quick to say, you know, no, 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 it's this, this issue we've settled long ago, and it's like, well, so we're dealing with all the other sin issues still. Um, you know, we're still wrestling with pride, and we're still wrestling with greed, but this one we got locked down. I'm like, I don't know, I just, I don't buy it. That's not my understanding of the scriptures, and so what are some other reasons you guys feel like this conversation, even for Christians and for the church, is such a difficult conversation to have? Yeah, I think it's, there are, there are two parts of it. One is this view of, but it's not me. No one wants to feel bad. And I think there's a context even from Genesis, we'll accept that we've inherited sin from Adam. Yet we weren't there in the garden. But somehow, we struggle with the expression of that orthodox, that, 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 that theological principle when it comes to people before us. That wasn't me. But I'm like, Christians, I think there's something about for such a time as this, as Esther says, that maybe we were called because we were the most spiritually equipped to be able to handle an issue like this because our theology says that we've inherited an unfair exchange, mm -hmm. that we have taken on a sin of something that we did not do. And so I think the reality, that shows you just how blinding sin is, that even for Christians, we celebrate Adam, and I'm born in sin, and I am, right? But then when somebody says, you know, look, you inherit, ah! Which one is it? <laughs> right? And I, so I think this just shows just how much we need a Savior every moment of the day. Mm. Because the fact that we celebrate that, but God may have equipped us to be able to handle the, the, the issues because we, we have, uh, like, theological resources to deal with that. It's just, it, I think that's part of the issue. One, one issue, but I'll stop one there. Issue. Yeah, yeah, just, just to add to that, I think on, on, on every different side of this conversation and uh, every different person that comes into this conversation, I think uh, has this sense that, well, 
there's an extent to which it's, it's not me, it's, not, it's someone else. But what I will say is true of everyone in this conversation, myself, everybody in this room, it's that in the brokenness of our world and the brokenness of our humanity, we are prone to feel threatened. And when we do, our response to that is to try to protect our own rights. And we live in a broken world that is marked by people protecting their own rights above everything else. Um, whereas what I believe the gospel is bringing about in this room, in the church, and in God's renewed world is, is not a world marked by us protecting our rights, but a world marked by us giving up our rights for the benefit of one another. Mm -hmm. And what, that, what I see is that this is a difficult conversation because at first, no matter who you are, where you're coming from, or what your background is, you come into a conver we all come into a conversation like this saying, I gotta protect my rights above all else. Whereas what would it look like for us to enter a conversation like this in, in, in God's renewed humanity uh, marked by empathy, which to me is largely a, a willingness to step into one another's story. So when I said earlier the, the, the fact that we are all prone to make assumptions about one another, what we are failing to do, including myself when I make assumptions about the people around me, which I do, um, what we're failing to do then is be willing to hear, lean into another person's story. And instead, we, we tend to label each other and, and kind of rob, every, rob others of the complexity of their stories, when in fact, what God is doing as he renews humans, he's taking that broken thing where we're trying to protect our own rights, and he's, and he's making something new. That's what the gospel's accomplishing. And what I think what he's doing there is, is he, by the power of the Holy Spirit, renewing people where we are now leaning into each other's stories. And rather than me protecting my rights, the way Jesus showed us, he gave up his rights for the benefit of others. Can, uh, yeah. can, I, offer, can I offer two things? I mean, I think part of even just the, the spirit of even what I shared was, you, you, you ever been to a meeting at work and it was clear somebody didn't do the pre-reading? <laughs> You know, you went to school, and you know, I called them like the, uh, the, 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 the volleyballers. You know, it's kind of like, I mean, building on what you said, you know, I was like, you didn't read, right? <laughs> you didn't read the report that the boss, you know, we sent out at nine, you know. And, and partly it's just like you'll send out as a manager that pre reading because you want everyone to be level set. You send out the primer so that we can have a constructive conversation. Part of the, uh, I think, the wrestle is that we don't all come in with the proper reading. We lack history. I even did. My parents were immigrants that came from Nigeria in the late 70s. I had no idea the history of what happened here, even with their own prejudices, until I read and did the work. And when I read the, when I actually did the extensive history, it wasn't, and that was in college. Mind you, I had been educated 18 years in Piscataway, New Jersey, in an amazing public school. So by the time I got there, I didn't learn about this until I got to college. We haven't all done the reading. We're not coming to this conversation with the same information, number one. And number two, in the same way that I, as a child, was overwhelmed about the consequences, I think part of the reason why is it's like, you know, when you like, sometimes you put the stuff under your bed in your room when you're cleaning it because it's just overwhelming, the mess. Similarly, I think in our country, we put stuff under bed because we don't know the implications of this is too much. Mm -hmm. It's too much. So what is going to be? It's going to be unfair. And then you bring yourself to the parable of those who were paid a certain amount of wages and they came in early. And then someone who came late got the same wage. And you're like, what happened? I think there's that part of our spirit that's idle. It's kind of like, that's unfair. What this is going to mean is unfair. This is too messy. How are we even going to deal with this? Put it under the bed. So I think those two things. Pastor Lawrence, I think that for me was one of the things that was difficult when uh, we started this renewed conversation about a year ago. There was a, I, I was in my head, I was all in. I figured, you know, this is, a, this is great for this country and our church to be wrestling with right now because these things have to change. We have to figure out what's going on. We have to explore these things. But inside me, there was this sort of resistance that I couldn't quite identify and I realized that the way I was raised was that colorblindness was essential. 
And so I was being told from a very, very early age, you're not supposed to look at color, you're not supposed to talk about color, you're not supposed to, and so if you're going to be, and to me, that was, a, that was progressive when I was a kid, like it felt like, the, like we were ahead of the people that were, were racists. And so, and I think probably because my mother, she's half, my, my, my mother's Spanish, I'm half Spanish, Puerto Rican, and so I think for me, I was like, well, of course, we should be, we should be, we should be colorblind. And so having the conversation so much about it felt like the racist thing to do. Mm. And, I was like, and so it took me a while and a whole lot of people of color who were saying, no, you're, you're missing it. We, we actually want to talk about this. We need to talk about this. Mm. We want you to try to understand and enter into the empathy piece. Uh, I think that's a great uh, encouragement for us. Mm. And, 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 yeah, I think part of the reason, so what the two of you are talking about is related. Because part of the reason we try to avoid the conversation altogether is because it is in many ways easier to just put it, just shove it under the bed. Uh, and the reason we want to do that is because there is hurt surrounding this conversation from every person involved in it, from every background, there is hurt. And the empathy piece comes in when we are acknowledging that, that hurt. I, I will say that, you know, the, the notion of color blindness is, um, it does a disservice to what God is in fact creating and renewing in, in his world. Any Play-Doh fans out there or your kids play with Play-Doh, right? So when my kids were little, they would take Play-Doh and they would take the different colors and they would make some grass and then they'd take the blue and make a little ocean and they'd be right next to each other. And then they'd take the yellow and make a sun and they'd do all these different things and all these colors were right next to each other and then it would be this beautiful thing. We'd be like, oh my goodness, you're so talented. Then they would take all the Play-Doh and put it into one, one ball. And uh, what color does it turn? Can anyone even describe that color? It's like, is it purple? Yeah, I, I'm, wow. not sure, I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure what it is, right? And the beauty of those things that made us different from one another formed a beautiful picture. This is what God intended all, the, all along. That not that we would be the same, but that we would be one. Hmm. And um, I think that when we ignore race and we don't talk about it, one, we ignore one another's hurt, but we also do a disservice to the beauty of God's creation, that we are not the same. The three of us up here are not the same, but we make Jesus shine and the gospel shine when we're one. Hmm. Hmm. I love that. Yeah. We, um, one of the things that uh, I was encouraged by over the last year and even challenged by and we were starting to watch some of the great videos that were being produced and read some of the books uh, that kind of drilled down into these topics uh, within the church community especially that's where I was most interested I, I was I understood the society the culture was kind of going through its own thing and its own convulsions I was really interested in trying to figure out how this works in the Jesus community, mm -hmm. uh, where we ought to be one and where we ought to be able to talk through and wrestle through these kinds of things. And this conversation of uh, systemic racism continued to come up over and over and over again. And uh, once again, I was somewhat surprised. And, you know, just, you know, for clarification's sake, this isn't, we're not talking about uh, critical race theory kinds of things. I know that's a big hot topic right now out there and stuff. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the fact that there are systems in our society that are geared against favoring one over another or designed to help favor someone over another, intentional or unintentional. That's not even really the question, but whether or not these systems exist. And I was taken aback by how many Christians I heard who were in denial over this which seemed odd to me because a, a simple reading of the Old Testament seemed to be God and the prophets continually talking to us about how our own personal battle with sin will manifest in systems that are, that are unjust. I mean, and, and you'll see it. There were economic systems that God put in place to sort of level the playing field. There were, he constantly critiqued the judges who would take bribes and who would not treat the poor fairly. He also went the other way to say, you know, you can't treat the poor better than you would treat the other. It's, there was a sense in which the prophets were trying to deconstruct systems that were hurting God's children. And that's a whole lot about the, the foreigners and all of this kind of stuff throughout the scriptures. Uh, the question of treating the, the people in bondage and poverty in different ways because they themselves had experienced it. It's just, it's woven throughout the whole of scriptures. Can we just talk a little bit about that idea of how race and systems sort of interplay a little bit? 
quick? Is it? Yeah, it's, um, this, is, this is heavy. I mean, I, I think even um, me just sitting in the book of Isaiah for my own study, you just recognize the, the impact of just king's decisions. <laughs> and, you know, the, it's like the people were, you know, the, Israel, the Israelites were just not really following what God was saying. But, you know, because of the sin, or Lama even going forward to Hezekiah, or because of the sin of the people, or the sin of the king, the people suffered, right? Or because of what the people did, right, Moses suffered. Right? There's, this, there's, these, there's these pictures of this kind of interplay of back and forth, and the king has power. The king has executive power over the nation. Um, and so I, I think this piece is hard because I think, again, part of his education. We've been taught to believe that racism is individual attitudes. That's it. I'm not a bad person. Just don't treat that person bad. It, it makes it, you know, and so that resolves it so ni- nice and neatly. And because our, our knowledge base is limited to that, we don't understand that the same people actually were running companies. You know that if a boss doesn't like you, you may not get a job, right? <laughs> you understand the implications made that may have for your family, right? If, some, if, if that person does not like this person's uh, sexual or- orientation, you may not get a job, right? That, that injustice, that, think about that. Think about systems, matter of all the people in that company didn't like a certain set of people. Think about now what that happens. Think about they then expand companies. I come from business. I was in a business for most of my, I was an investment banker. Then I was a consultant. And you see the power that these individuals have. But whose names are on the companies? So, over, over the majority of companies that we actually work for are someone's last name, some family's name. You don't think they had attitudes? You don't think they had any institution about if you start a business, wouldn't you want to work with people you like? Now think about that at scale at the verticals of industries. And I, don't, I think because, again, we, we, when once we see that word, our brains, confirmation bias, and, and block out, when you actually just break it down in that fashion, you'd be like, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make sense if we don't think that institutions don't manifest what individuals think and feel, right? Um, and so I, I, I think that's part of the issue is, again, our education around this is really about individual attitudes, and it's just like, no, it's institutional. It's always been institutional. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. I I think we need to realize, you know, it's it's really a Western thing where we're this individualistic, (laughs) right? Um, Other parts of the world don't necessarily feel this way. They have a deeper appreciation of their corporate identity, whereas here we feel like, okay, well, if I deal with my own assumptions about others and I deal with my own racism, classism, whatever it might be, well, then everything will get better. But what you described is, 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 and what is described in scriptures shows us, this is not an original story, <laughs> right? So we, we live in a broken world that is made up of broken people who together form broken systems. Um, but I think that we have to appreciate that those systems don't get healed, repaired individually alone. Um, yeah, there is personal choice and personal um, objectives and, and, and growth and movement, that is true. Uh, but what, what the gospel shows us, and the reason why the authors of the Bible spend so much time talking about what God is doing in community is because this community right here is a system, um, just like every corporate body is a system. And the current systems are broken because the world is broken. But as I said earlier, God is taking this broken thing and he's building something new. Mm-hmm. I, 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 heard, I heard a pastor say, recently, you know, talking about the church, saying, you know, could the last be first in here? Mm-hmm. Could, could this be a place that is marked by generosity and compassion and a willingness to give up our rights for the benefit of, the, uh, benefit of another mm-hmm. and, and live out the fullness of, of God's renewed world, what he's doing in renewed humans and what he's doing in a renewed community and the ways that he's renewing his world at large. This is, you know, th- there's, a, there's a concept common grace, or sometimes we believe that the innovations of the world, if you don't understand common grace, that God is holding everything together, even in places where people do not worship God, um, then you will think that all of the innovations of society only exist in the church. Here's what I mean by that. This is an opportunity for us. You know, for me, from a business perspective, I'm always, when I look at companies and how they're built, I'm always like, Christians should be the ones leading when it comes to um, innovations on how we build uh, organizations that show that we understand where the light is, 
right, where I see companies where actually pay wages that people could actually live on, that they're pro-family, that they do these things. And I'm like, was that a Christian? And a lot of times they're not, right? How could they, how could they you know, in this organization be sustainable, but th- th- their people are, so, like, we should be leading the way in terms of how we think about, the, and, I, and I think we lose sight of this, the light of the world. And even in our own theology, we think that even God's ways, I'm not talking about like, you know, as, as a theocracy. What I'm saying is that there's something beautiful about God's ways. Mm-hmm. There's something beautiful about how, how have a heart of redemption and how to th- we think about our justice mm-hmm. systems, right? Because we have a peculiar relationship with justice, don't we? Right? We were guilty. <laughs> but somehow we've been redeemed. But somehow our systems are so punitive Somehow our light doesn't touch the world there, right? And so I think it's actually the opportunity that God invites us to, which is why I think the business community, every place you work, you are a light. Mm -hmm. When you think about the policies, you're a light. How does God's thinking impact? And so I think when we think of justice, we think of everything. Just think of the biblical narrative. What are the patterns and themes? What what is the thrust that is so forgiving and so these things? Maybe that light may be helpful to the world. Mm -hmm. That's such an encouragement because I read an article, it was just, I think it was this week, it was a story about a, a young black man, he'd been picked up for a minor drug charge, and uh, the, ju- uh, the judge uh, took a whole different route with him and kind of made certain he got into some sort of a program and he, he like gave him a, a stern kind of a talking to about how, you know, he sees like some beauty and wonder in him and something like this, and it ends up, you know, it was one of the few times he'd heard that and he took it to heart and started to, you know, kind of do these, uh, live in a different sort of a way. And then I think it was uh, years later, it was the same judge who was overseeing his, um, his admission into law school or his graduation from law school or something. And there was like this, you could see how you could bring a redemptive influence into an individual's life but of course, if you have position of power, you can bring that same restoration into the systems that you are a part of. Mm. And uh, so often when you talk about the kings who would do evil in the Old Testament, it reminds me of the kings who also did good, right? They were the ones who, in, in, the, in the vein of Abraham, were actually uh, living the promise of Abraham, which was to be a blessing to the world. Mm. And so you, you see others throughout history uh, doing that, and uh, just an encouragement to me to say, let us do that, let me do that, let my family do that, and of course, our, our spiritual family to try to encourage us all to, to be those sorts. So what, tell me something, if, um, if you had like an idea or two or a thought about something that a person who is interested in this conversation, uh, or maybe who isn't interested in this conversation, but maybe, maybe ought to be in some way, uh, or those who want to do something, like what, what you, just something practical, some next steps from your perspective that we could take away from a conversation like this and really the whole of the last year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would start with this, not, not to sound cliche, but what does it look like to do what Jesus did? So uh, wh- what, what would we, Jesus do? We should, that's good. <laughs> you know, I almost would say, a, w, you know, we should w- abbreviate it. One of my favorite authors... Dallas Willard frames it this way. He says, what would Jesus do if he were you? Right? (laughs) So what would Jesus do if he were you? So, you know, what what blows my mind when I read through the Gospels is that Jesus was going around and everything he was touching was getting his goodness and his light on it. And sometimes that was physically healing people and sometimes it was um, just filling people with hope he was, he was just bearing the presence of God everywhere he goes. And what the gospel says is that that is now true of every follower of Jesus, mm-hmm. that we get to bear his presence in the places that we go. Mm. So at a minimum, what does it look like? I mean, just one or two things that come off the top of my head would be even what we started, or at least what I had mentioned initially in this conversation about empathy, uh, about Jesus was willing to hear and lean into people's stories. You know, when, when his friend Lazarus died and Martha and Mary were weeping and he knew Lazarus was coming back, he knew he was going to bring him back in just a few minutes, he, he leaned into their story and he grieved and he wept with them. And whether it's an individual that's grieving or an entire ethnic group that is grieving in some way, what does it look like for us not to respond in a way that protects my own right and 
robs them of the right to grieve, but bearing Jesus' presence and saying, if you are grieving, I'm going to grieve with you. And maybe there's lots of conversations to be had. Um, and maybe I'd like for you to understand my own pain and my own grief, but when I see you grieve, I'm rather than holding on to my rights, I'm going to give up my rights for your benefit, and I'm going to grieve with you, and I'm going to empathize with you. One of the many things that Jesus did. So what does that look like? I loved what you talked about in businesses, in your, in your environment. What would Jesus do if he were you in your setting, and, and what does that look like? So, right. Yeah. I, I love it, and, and, I, and I think even taking it even a step further with Love is always difficult when we talk about it in the public square because all of us divine love differently. We also have a different version of Jesus in our mind, right, about what Jesus would do. I think there are two things that I think are important. Number one, there's something about Acts 17.11 in the Bereans where they went back to study the scriptures to see if what the apostles said was true. Uh, disciples are students. They're learners. Teacher, teacher, teach us. We need to go read and actually learn our history and, and really learn it and read it as much. And I think this is a heavy one because it, 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 it's humbling to believe that we're so educated but know so little about the reality of this country. And I, and I would start there because no matter what you do, if you don't have a st history will always override. It, it will always override. And so if you are not starting from a baseline, you're going to struggle because you still don't understand what really happened. Um, and so I, I would challenge Christians to be Christian, mm -hmm. to study the scriptures and study the history because our scriptures are part history. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the pattern. Number two, I think this, this is a helpful framework that I, part of our pride, and I'm saying everyone involved in this conversation, there's, a, there's almost a low level pride to it, which is, is that if, I, if that were me, I would be different. And I, what frees me up to be able to have a grace-filled conversation or engage with this or get tired, I'm like, I'm tired of talking about this, I'm tired of educating people, I'm tired, is the reality of, we always like to look back and say, if I were living at that time, I would have been an abolitionist. I would have been out there, you know, everybody thinks they would have been that. And it's like, no, <laughs> if you were born to the same parents, were given the same values, living at the same time, if the only world you knew was that, you would be just like them. And my grace is that I see myself, I would be just like them. And they would be just like me. And that framework helps me, I have to almost pray that through in moments when we have this conversation where I don't feel better then because this person has this attitude. They actually had no choice in it, did they? Hmm. That baby had no choice but to be born in sin. And so I think, sim I think that's a helpful uh, way uh, to, 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 to really, really view this. And, and, and I think that's my challenge. And number one, history, really knowing your history. And number two, don't get prideful about this. None of us have arrived. Until Jesus comes back, none of us will arrive. Mm, and great. I think that is word. very helpful. And, and, and those two things that you're describing, I think, are the foundation of what allows us to approach this conversation and approach one another with understanding. Yeah. Mm. Both, at, both the history and, uh, like a, a, I think, a, a recognition of who we are, where we come from, and then a recognition of where others come from and the mm. way that informs their attitude perspective. It's, it's what allows us to approach each other with understanding, Yes. which in many ways is, that's, that's the foundation. That's what everything yeah. else is built on. Trevor and I were talking um, recently and we were saying, you know, when we go and learn something, we read something, we study something, we figure it out, we immediately turn to the people who don't know it and are like, how can you not know this? I've learned it like 28 days ago. I don't understand. I don't understand why we're still discussing this. And so part of a commitment, I told you guys a year or so ago now that um, we as a congregation, we're going to continue to sharpen our own understanding and conversation around this issue of race. And uh, I thought it'd be a good time just to give you a quick little update on some of the commitments that we have made as a congregation. Uh, and some of the steps that we've taken. And so we have uh, strengthened the race conversation in our leadership training uh, plans. And so we've added that to both our leadership incubator as well as our regular conversations among uh, training uh, our staff, uh, our leaders. We've also strengthened the race conversation in our discipleship classes. Uh, which is a part of the training that we offer for all of you, which means we will also continue that conversation in the small groups. Uh, we have uh, looked out and realized so many of these issues that deal with poverty and the systems are largely because people aren't, 
they don't know each other and we're not involved in the, the kinds of things that could bring the, the Christ emphasis and the Christ healing into these circumstance situations. And so we've strengthened our relationships with some of our uh, ethnic ministry partners and uh, the foster care system and some other things like that, that uh, we recognize uh, there are these broken parts of society that we can actually help with in very real and practical ways. And so we've been doing some of that uh, as well. Uh, we also will continue to work through our pastoral leadership incubator. It was already uh, very diverse as uh, a representative of our congregation, uh, which is a very diverse congregation. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that uh, as we, you know, seek to add more and more folks. And of course, you've seen the diversification of both the leadership team and our preaching ministry, our teaching ministry at uh, the church, all part of this ongoing effort to keep the conversation before us and to keep uh, the learnings um, going, keep it important uh, as a key biblical value until it becomes just such a natural part of who we are as followers of Jesus. It becomes one of those pieces of biblical justice that, um, that we, can, uh, we can really be proud of being a part of uh, working out in this world. So I would just want to thank these guys. Can you give them a round of applause for joining us for this conversation? Thank you guys so much. And I'm going to ask you guys to uh, stand as uh, we, uh, we're going to have a, a worship song here. The band is going to come on out. And so, again, thank you guys so very, very much for joining us. Thanks and, for having uh, us. We want to